How can we have a kind of marriage that's not only pleasing to God, but pleasing to us, considering that we are very different from our spouse? When I say that, I, I, I think of this old story of, of this young couple, and they're about to be married, and they're engaged, and they've been through all of the marriage, pre-marriage counseling, but each one of them have a secret, and they have not shared it with anybody, especially not the other person, and they are deathly afraid that the other person is going to discover the secret. And one day, the, uh, just a, a few days before the wedding, the boy goes to his dad and gets fatherly advice, and he says, Dad... I'm about to get married to the love of my life, but I have this, this secret and, and, and I don't know what to do. And he goes, what is it, son? And he said, dad, no matter what I do, I have the worst smelling feet of anybody that I have ever, ever seen. They're just bad. And I, and I think that they're so bad that it's going to be a deal breaker uh, after we get married and, and she's going to think less of me. And, and, and he says, what do I do? At the same time, the girl had a big secret as well. And so she goes to her mom and, and she goes, mom, I have this problem. And, and her mom is concerned and says, what is it, sweetie? And she said, when I wake up in the morning, I have the worst breath you can imagine. And I'm afraid that I'm going to wake up and there's the love of my life. And I'm going to, you know, see him and, and, and turn to say hi or give him a kiss. And he's going to run away from me. And, and she said, what do I do? And he asked his dad, what do I do? The parents gave good advice. And the dad said, son, I got you. Here's what you do. Just wear your shoes all day. And after you take a shower, quickly put on socks. And then wear your socks to bed. Just wear your socks. Develop a habit where you wear your socks to bed every night. And you will be fine. She'll never know. And, and the the... The mom said, here's what you do. You just wake up earlier than he does. You run in, brush your teeth, and come back to bed. He'll know it's okay. Well, dad gum, for six months, a half a year, they did it, and it worked well. Man, she never knew about his feet, and he never knew about her breath. Man, they were doing great until one night. And one night, he had a nightmare, and he's thrashing and turning in his bed over and over. And, and in all of the movement, a sock came off. And he woke him up and he starts feeling, feeling around in the bed for it. And in and, and all the commotion, it wakes her up. And she turns and she said, what in the world are you doing? And he looked at her and said, ah, you swallowed my sock. And uh, I, 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 y'all, I think about that when I think about how radically different we are. And the truth is that we are all imperfect, amen? We all have smelly feet and bad breath, and we cannot achieve perfection. But that doesn't mean that, it, that, that we have to settle for anything less than God's beautiful and wonderful design for our marriage. And there is something that you and I have often gotten wrong and Christians have gotten wrong for a long time about God's design that has caused many of the problems in our marriages. And we're gonna talk about this. This issue has, has been a cause for infidelity. It has been a cause and, and often at the root for bad communication. It has increased spousal abuse. It's increased narcissism and selfishness. So what I'm about to tell you this morning, I want you to hang on because it is a very, very big deal. We, we have messed up God's design and, and, and it's killing us. It's killing the marriages in this room and it's hurting people. And so what we have to do is obviously say, well, what is God's design? So we're gonna look at God's design first and then we're gonna explore exactly how we messed it up. And then we're going to think about, well, what are our solutions then for this? And, and I want you to know the reward for y'all sticking with me and working and giving this sermon a shot, the reward is going to be better than you ever could have imagined. And I don't believe that I'm overstating that. So please give God's word in this sermon a chance today. And so we're going to find the design of God and, and where would we look? I think we need to look for God's design first in two book ends, two bookends, how God designed things at the very beginning and the design for marriages and relationships and the design for, for men and women that he is 
bringing us toward in the end. Genesis is the beginning and heaven is the end. How God made us and where God is taking us as humanity. And, and so when we think about the beginning, we think of Genesis 1 and, and, and Genesis 2. And in Matthew 19, Jesus points to Genesis 1 and 2 and says, look, this is your, 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 your ideal marriage. This is what you're supposed to move toward. And in Genesis 1, of course, you know, God is creating all of the heavens and the earth. And every day he does so, he says, ah, he smiles and says, this is good. But then on day six, he creates men and women. Uh, and, and when he sees them and how they exist in the world, he says, no, 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 it's not just good. This is very, very good. And then that's Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, it continues this idea of the creation of man and woman, but Genesis 2 tells it very differently from Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, Adam and Eve are created on the same day, day six. But in Genesis 2, Adam and Eve were not created on the same day. Adam was working the land, naming all of the animals. And he does that for a good while before the woman is actually made in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, Adam is working and, and his work is a blessing. He's naming all the animals, spending time with them. And, and God notices something that has not been said since the beginning because at this point, this is good, this is good, this is very good. It's all good, everything is. But then for the first time in the Bible, God notices something that's not good. And it says, God noticed this, and it was not good that man was alone. He noticed that there was no living being in the world that could be side by side with man, that man was deeply and profoundly lonely, and he needed something. And even God's own companionship, remember God would come down and, and walk with Adam in the cool of the mornings and in the evenings, God was Adam's companion. And yet not even God's companionship was everything that Adam needed. Adam needed somebody like himself. He needed another human being. So God created woman and he created marriage. And, and unlike all the animals, she was absolutely perfectly matched. They were so similar, but they were so wonderfully different at the same time. In Genesis 2, 18, God describes the woman like this. He said, the woman is his suitable helper. And the King James Version says that she is his help meet, from where we get the word helpmate, that the woman is man's helpmate. Now, the Hebrew word for helpmate that's used there is the word Easer. Everybody say easer with me. Easer. Easer. The, the easiest Hebrew word you'll ever memorize. This word, easer, helper, does not mean that women, that the woman was man's helper in the way that you and I often are tempted or the way that we typically think about woman being helper or anybody being our helper. When we think of the word that somebody is somebody else's helper, the thing that enters into our mind is, well, somebody is a boss and the other person is like an assistant to that boss. That's where our mind, our mind goes, almost as if the man is in charge and the woman is kind of like a secretary. She is the helper for that person. Some people take that idea and then they go even further with it and, and they read this to mean that that, that, that Eve's whole value, she gets her value in her support and help of that man and that without, without him, she wouldn't even exist at all. Now, if you were to carry that out to its conclusion here, if you were to imagine, is it true that a woman is only valuable if she is connected to a man? And, and, and if that is true, what about our widows whose husbands die? Do they start to become less in value? What about a woman who is a single and, 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 and doesn't get married? Is she less in valuable? Less in value because she, she, she's not um, the helper of a kind of man. It's not that at all. So it must be something different than all of that. But some people see this and, and they think that, that she has to be his, his aid and back him up in everything as if she's subordinate all the time, that he orders and she obeys. 
That's the common way that many Christians read this passage and uh, uh, when they read that the woman is man's helper. But y'all, that is not what Ezer means. And this is the first way that we have messed up God's design. And because we've messed up God's design in this, it, it, it really, really does affect our marriages and our lives. The word Ezer means shield bearer. It means the one who protects and the one who defends. Women, doesn't that sound better? It does. Most of the time, the Hebrew word Ezer actually refers to God himself. Like in these passages, let me show you. In Psalm 46, it says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present Ezer in trouble, meaning an ever-present help, that God is this. And that's the word that was used for what a woman is. Look at the next one is Psalm 121. Again, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my ease or my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This is the connotation, women, that, that really you're supposed to be able to be. Carolyn James has a book that says, When Life and Beliefs Collide. And she said that of the 19 times of the 21 times that this word Ezer appears in the whole Bible. So it only comes up 21 times, but 19 of the 21 times, the word has a military, strong battling connotation with it. It, it. Like when Israel is in trouble and they need a strong God, not a weak God, a strong God to come to their aid and save them in their moments of need. This is this strong idea. So by using this word, Ezer, with its military ideas, God is trying to say this, that the wife is supposed to be a powerful ally standing beside, fighting together with her husband for the values of the kingdom of God and the values of their own marriage and family. And if we let scripture interpret scripture, and that's always the best way to do it, Ezer means that God made women to be a fellow warrior and a worker with man, not inferior, wonderfully different, thank God, but an equally gifted partner created in God's image who will fight the battle of, for God's kingdom with man so that God's will might be done on earth. You see, the the a woman is not lower than a man, not spiritually or hierarchically lower in any of those ways. She is a perfect and much needed partner for the man. God designed it like this. He designed it so that uh, uh, men and women could have a kind of relationship where they depend on each other and lean against each other for reciprocal love and reciprocal help. And, and the wife is doing the same thing. The wife isn't below. She is his easer. And so many Christians just blow it right here and they get it wrong. And, and they start to, to see a weird kind of hierarchy. God created man and woman with equality in this first bookend. But now here's the other bookend at the very end. God's design further is seen in the last book about heaven, revelation. I want you to picture what heaven is going to be like for a minute because we're told to live out heaven. Picture what heaven, when you think about heaven, is your picture of heaven that men are going to rule over women in, in, in eternity? When God is sitting on his throne in heaven, is that the picture? Do you have a picture of a spiritual hierarchy where even in heaven, men are still above women and have authority over them even in heaven? If you don't, and I certainly don't see heaven like that at all, we don't see it that way. In fact, when somebody does see it that way, it is more akin to an odd Islamic view, Islamic view of, of men and women where women serve men forever. A good Muslim man uh, Sharia law and, and the, uh, the, their, their sacred text says a good Muslim man is going to get all of these virgin women who are going to serve him for all eternity. That, that, that's their idea of heaven, but it's not Christianity. It's not our faith. In Revelation 7, it describes this scene where everybody is standing equal before the Lord. You have all the tribes 
all of the races, all of the culture, men and women, all of the people, all right there standing before the Lord in equality, not in a hierarchy where any group or any um, sex is bigger or mightier than the other. And so this is what we see is this is the, um, the first bookend, Genesis, and the last bookend, heaven and Revelation. So the question is, how do we live out this biblical design as we live in between the bookends, in between our creation and in between how we're going to be? And here's why we often so get this wrong. Our problem and the reason we miss it so often is because we are still living in the effects of Genesis chapter three, when man and woman sinned and it messed up God's design for their life. When they sinned, this is what took this beautiful equal place and it, and it messed it up. And here's what the Bible says. Look at this. This is um, um, in Genesis 3. This is what the Bible says. When sin came into the world, because of sin to the woman, God said, you will have pain and childbearing and your desire will be for your husband. And he will what? He will rule over you rule over you. That's not how God created it. This is what happened because of sin. It's not the beginning, not anywhere close. And it's not where we're headed in heaven. And it's not what Jesus pointed to in Matthew 19. The sin, what it did, it got it all wrong. Sin comes in and, and then men start ruling over women. And then it says, and her desire will be for her husband, which means that because he's starting to rule over her, she will battle back and try to rule over him. And now they're fighting with one another. So there you go. The battle of the sexes begin. Let's get ready to rumble. And the man, they go at each other from then on. And when you take two different people, one with smelly feet and the other with bad breath, and you stack on top of that this sinful inclination to see who's in charge all the time, who's gonna get the final say and who gets their way, then you get disaster. You get disaster. And, and this is what caused men to want to dominate. It's, it's sin. This is what causes a radical version of feminism a radical version of that, where they're not just fighting for their own right, but they're fighting to, in radical feminism, to actually overcome and to rule over men. And so we see this. When, when, when we see these things, we see them all over the world. Where, where in, in the world do you start to see this kind of men will rule mentality? I see it in the Middle East all the time. Have you noticed how women are treated there that when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, who are the first person who were kicked out of schools? The girls. The women were kicked out. It's like they were too um, invaluable to have a real education. That's what they were doing. That is called patriarchy. Patriarchy. Patriarchy it describes any culture where men are naturally given a status above women. Patriarchy is the result of sin. God didn't create it that way. It's not the direction he's taking us. And, and, but we see it in these places in our world. Thank God our country is not that way. I wish. Uh, the, the, the truth is that, that, that our country has struggled a lot. It took us a long time to give women a right to vote. And they still fought it. In the very end, when they finally voted on all that, and a lot of men still voted against it. There's a lot of men who'd probably vote against it today. Uh, the, it took women a long time to be able to get into a lot of schools. At Baylor University didn't invite women to join schools at the beginning. What we did was we created, created Mary Harden Baylor. Mary Harden Baylor was made as a woman's school. We sent all of our girls to Mary Harden Baylor. The preacher boys at Baylor needed somebody to marry. So they created Mary Harden Baylor in Belton, and then you have uh, Baylor and Waco, and they would all meet and have dates in Temple and uh, uh, try to spend time with each other there, meet halfway. Uh, we, we, we've missed it too, and we've missed it so much as Christians, even in our enlightened um, culture. 
in churches, we miss it so much that, that the sin of Genesis 3 affects our ability to read Scripture properly and rightly. And when we take the Word of God, sin uh, it hinders our ability to interpret it. Let me remind you guys that sin always affects our ability to interpret the Word of God well. It always does. And here is one way that, that, that because we've put on these lenses, how we have taken a passage of Scripture and twisted it out of its context and created something with it that was not God's design. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at this. Ephesians 5, verse 20, uh, 22. I have it on the screen right here. This is a famous passage when people, when Christians often talk about marriage and life and love and all of this, they go right here. Well, how do wives and husbands need to go? They go to this and they go, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And the husbands are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How many of you have heard that quoted before, seen that before? Okay. And many of you, when you see that, it's like, ah, this is the quintessential verse. Here's how to have a great marriage. Here is what women have to do. And here's what men have. The women's job uniquely is to submit because he didn't say men should submit there. The women submit, the men uniquely have to love. And then people create all of these reasons why it was unique like that. They'll say, oh, well, the reason that women have to submit, but not the man is because what men really need is, is somebody who will deeply respect and listen to them and obey and do what they say. And that's really what men need, that deep kind of submission from somebody. And really what women need is not all of that. Women just need affection to feel loved all the time. And so they say, and they, and they, they, they divide it really hard. Hogwash hogwash. It's totally not true. It takes scripture way out of context and it ignores all the other scripture that talks about these things. The Bible doesn't say, oh, men, you're the only ones who have to love. Wives, could you imagine if you don't have to love your husbands? Doesn't the Bible in 1 John say, love one another? Love one another. Does he have to be specific? Hey, wives, don't forget, that includes you. They, and, and, and here is how we, we, we mess it up when we read. Because we put on this lens, we actually divide a passage in an unnatural way. Because look at this passage. In Ephesians 5.21, oh, this is the verse right before the one I just read. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Now, who, who does that include? Men too, doesn't it? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But what we do, and a lot of times Bibles will even do this, it separates verse 21, which is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ from verse 22, wives submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. It's as if it divides it like that. They're not to be divided. They are together. In fact, the word submit um, is a verb that's in verse 21, doesn't even exist in wives submit to your husbands unless you put them together. The only way to get a complete sentence is to read it like this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives to your husbands is unto the Lord. It, 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 it's obvious. We submit to one another. Jesus wants us to do that. Paul tells us in Philippians to do this. It means husbands and wives mutually loving each other, mutually submitting to one another. Y'all, there is nothing wrong with compromise in a marriage. When you put the other person's thoughts and desires and their things before your own, to put the other person first because we are partners in that. The Bible really teaches that we're both supposed to love and both supposed to listen to the other person and hear what they have to say. And, and, and both are supposed to submit. Husbands, Listen to me, it will not kill you to do this. In fact, all of you know as well as I do that in real life, you are already submitting to your wife in all of kinds of ways. You already know. I, so so don't, don't, don't give me any baloney here. We already know that this is how real life is. There is no such thing as a healthy marriage when only one person compromises all the time and the other person gets their way all the time. Nobody does that. 
They can, because they can't do it, because it's unhealthy, because it's toxic to do that. So we don't. If you want your marriage to be healthy, this is the practical way. What I'm just lining up is now we have true biblical doctrine to support what we already do and where we already are. It's, it's, it's biblical and it is practical from an everyday sense. And this is how we really live in our marriages. And I believe that we should all refuse for our Christian faith to reflect the oppressive in dark places that we see in so many places that's like an Islamic law kind of a thing where a woman has to walk steps behind their husband. And, and in fact, y'all, it embarrasses me. I'm embarrassed for any man who, when they talk about their relationship with their wife or their relationship with women in general, and they start giving this kind of patriarchal beating their, their chest kind of stuff. I'm embarrassed for them. Not only is it unbiblical, but it continues to advance the sin of patriarchy. Any talk, any talk like I'm the ruler of this house or vice versa, where the woman sneakily manipulates, manipulates to try to get her best uh, 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 to, to rule over her husband. Anyway, both of the, those arguments are what's called a false dichotomy. And we're, we're, they're both still competing in this who gets to be in charge place. Y'all, there is a better way. There's a better way and God's going to give us a solution here for it, a better way. Uh, I, when I think of God's solution that it's so much better, the, the issue is, are we going to listen to it? Are we gonna understand it? God gives us a better way, just we don't, sometimes we don't get it at all. It goes way over our head. When, when I hear about, we have a good solution, but we don't get it. Did, did I ever tell you that story about a couple who goes to counseling one day and, and the wife is just lifeless. She's lifeless and she's struggling and she's just there and her head is down and the counselor is doing everything he can to try to give life to her. And, uh, and, and finally, at the end of the counseling session, the counselor gets up from around his desk. He comes over and he gets her head and he just kisses her right on the mouth. And man, she, it was like life came back into her. She couldn't, she, it shocked her and her heart was beating. She goes, oh my goodness. And then he looked over at her, her husband and he said, you see, this is what your wife needs. This is my prescription for her. And, and the husband says, well, I, I understand, but I work a lot during the week. Maybe I can bring her in to you on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Aha. It's horrible, isn't it? God, God says, here is a solution, but we don't get it. God's solution is that we can, we can live in a way that, that, that moves us out of Genesis 3 and we can experience the first book in and the second. Here's the way we get out of the first book in. Yes, sin came into the world and it messed up men and women, but y'all praise God. The apostle Paul says, we do not live in the place of sin and the consequence of sin any longer. We are set free from the burden of sin by the power of Jesus and the blood of his cross and living in the power of his Holy Spirit and his resurrection. We don't have to live a life of sin any longer. We can go back to the way that it was created at the beginning. Through Jesus Christ, we're not living in Genesis 3. Second, well, what about the last book in? When we picture heaven, Jesus said in the Lord's prayer, when you pray, you say this, um, um, Lord, thy kingdom come right now on earth as it is in heaven. So when we picture heaven and this beautiful equality between people, then what we do is we bring that and as Christians, we begin to live that out. That's the solution and this is how we do it it is the solution for many things. Here are, here are a couple of them. This is the solution for lust. Because then a person of the opposite sex, if you start in this theology that I'm giving to you, and, and men, you don't see yourself as a hierarchy above them, where, where, where the role of women is to serve. When you don't start there, it gives you a solution for lust. Because a person of the opposite sex is now your equal equal in value and status, not a person submissive to you so that you can objectify them. 
where we come to this place where, 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 where men, the women here with us, they are our sisters. They're our sisters. And, 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 and they're with us in this. And it means women, men are your brothers. It's also this, it is a solution for all, for women all over our world who feel a need to weaponize sex. In history, when women have not been given equality, they have sometimes used the power of sex to give themselves a voice and opportunity. In patriarchal societies, often women have re- had to resort to sex as power. And that's not the way, that's not the reason that God gives sex to us. And it's not to be used as a weapon for power. Imagine though, y'all, a world, imagine where women are 100% equal in every way. And then they don't have to use their body as a collateral to to give themselves a voice and to give themselves an opportunity and a chance. Prostitution goes away. Abortions go way down. Here's probably my favorite one, and, and, I, and I think this will strike home with all of us here because it, it, it's very true. This is the last solution, and it's my favorite one. When we get this equality thing right, here's what it achieves. It is a solution for every Christian marriage where the husband feels like a failure, um, a, a failure because he doesn't feel like he's living up to being the spiritual leader of his house, And his wife constantly criticizes in her mind and and, and maybe even verbally and thinks and says to him, you know what, why aren't you doing this spiritually for us? And why aren't you doing this? Wives, all of you wives, let me ask you, has there ever been a moment in your mind when you thought, maybe you didn't even say it, but you thought, I wish my husband were a better spiritual leader? Husbands, has there ever been a moment in in your heart and life where you thought, oh, I'm not the spiritual leader I should be? Man, and, and, and I know this happens. I know it does. A long time ago, we had just moved into the building and a, and a good friend, a Christian husband came to see me. And, and he said, Ross, I can't do anything right for my wife. I work hard and I'm faithful to her. I try to you know, help in the house and I bring our family to church, but, but she asks me why I'm not doing more to be a spiritual leader and asks me why I'm not leading in devotionals all the time. And then he started crying. And, and I love this person. And, and so it's, it was hard. And he, and he said this, I feel like if I don't, that she has this expectation that if I don't wake up at 4 a.m., do my own personal Bible study, then wake the whole rest of the family up, lead the whole family in a devotional that morning, and then all throughout the day, constantly send my wife and my kids biblical texts and prayers and, and encouraging them biblically all day long. And then when we get home, lead the family in a whole other evening devotional. And then before my wife and I go to bed, we pray together. He says, if I, I feel like if I don't do all of that, then somehow I'm failing. And she always asks me why I'm not doing more and more. And then he said, I just, I can't. He says, I, am I bad? How do I do more? And he says, I've tried and I've only lasted this long. Is this my, and, and he's just so defeated in all of it. All of that argument and all of that frustration and all of that comes from this odd idea of a spiritual hierarchy that they believed in, where where the wife needed her husband to be this as as if he is some kind of mediator between, between her and God to act as a priest kind of over the family. And, and when he didn't do it, she, she was struggling and frustrated and she didn't know what she was gonna do and it hurt him. And then he could never be vulnerable with her because he knew that he wasn't living up to it. And it, and it, and it, and it put a block between them because he can't say, hey, I'm failing, I'm, I'm struggling. I, I used bad language the other day, I did this. How, how does a husband be transparent and valuable to a wife who says, but you have to be all of this, not me. Not me, the burden is on you to do it. How does anybody survive? This is not a recipe for peace in a marriage. At the same time, the next week I experienced this. A few days later, a husband and a wife came to talk to me and they had just visited the church. 
And, and they came in the next Monday. I said, I wanna see you and visit with you. They came in. They were not Christians and they told me so. The only reason they had come to church is because one of y'all invited them to come because y'all are awesome like that. You invited them and they came and they said, we love the church. This was exciting. And I said, well, tell me about your life. When did you give your life to Christ? And they said, oh, we've never done that. Well, were you ever baptized? No, we've never been baptized. This was brand new, but we really liked it. Like the music. And I said, man, I'm so glad y'all were here. And, and, and I said, tell me about your life. Tell me about your marriage and kids and all of that. So they're just talking. And y'all, they are lost as a goose. Every word's like a cuss word coming out, talking about their life, crazy life that they were talking about. And, but when she started to talk about her husband, she was smiling from ear to ear. And she said, I have a great husband, best husband in the world. And I said, really, man, tell me. And he works so hard. And, and provides for us, he's kind to me. And, and I said, really? And then, and then I'm asking him, you know, what do you do for a hobby? And he goes, man, I love uh, like three or four nights a week, I go drinking with my friends. And, and, and it turns out that she's doing all the housework. He's not doing much housework at all, but, but he takes his family out sometimes on the weekend to go out on the lake. And the whole time she's smiling and holding his hand. And, 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 and I couldn't believe it. There was something I thought, God, I'm, I'm missing something as a Christian with all of this because it seemed like a, a wife who did not know Jesus as her Lord and Savior loved her husband more than the Christian wife did. That's the way that it seemed. This man who didn't give even half the effort to trying to, to really do well and to try to hold the family up, this guy who wasn't doing hardly any of those things, and yet the wife love them. Why? Why? I was so confused. How? Because the Christian couple could not achieve an unrealistic and unbiblical expectation that the entire responsibility for the spiritual well-being of their house fell primarily to him and was all on his shoulders to do these things. Spiritual hierarchy always leads to this kind of struggle it, and it's not peaceful. A long time ago, Megan and I were talking about this and, and our marriage and, and we realized that the Bible gives us a different way and we started to do something different. We're now, Megan and I lead our family together. And guys, it is such a blessing for me. Megan reads scripture. I'm there, I'm listening. Megan reads scripture. She does devotionals for our family and for our girls. And guess what? I listen and learn. If I have ever been a good pastor for any of you, and if I have ever said anything good from up here, if I've ever done anything like that, that, that y'all find valuable, so much of it has to do because I've learned it from Megan and she's taught it to me over the years. That's, that's true. I've learned it from you as well. I've learned it from school. I've learned it from our deacons. I've learned it from people. I simply am reflecting to you what all the best people in the world have given to me, but my wife is primary in that. And we lead it together. Um, and, and, and it is a wonderful experience that, that I have a true partner in life and it doesn't fall all on my shoulders. And because of that, she carries it. And now I can be transparent and vulnerable and I mess up and she can too. But could you imagine if all of it was only on me, then she would be frustrated and so would I, and we would both not be good and discouraged. And I've seen it over and over again. Did you know that, and here we'll end with this, the Greek word for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. The, the word when it says the husband is the head of the wife, it's the Greek word kephale. And that word does not mean a kind of authoritarian general or colonel that commands other people to do certain things. That's not what this word head even means. There's another word for head that does mean that. But, but Paul did not use that word. He used this word, kephale. And most of the time, what kephale is indicating is not a general who's in charge of the army, commanding and authority, telling them what to do. What kephale really is, is somebody who is like a scout, a scout in an army, same rank, same status, right with everybody else. And the general tells the scout, run ahead of the rest of the army. 
run ahead and you take the risks upon yourself. If there is a difficulty that's gonna come, you be an example for your family and you hold that. It doesn't mean that you're a kind of authoritarian person, but it means men that we take the risks. We run ahead but it is not a kind of status thing and it's not a hierarchy thing. We run ahead of our families and say, it's safe, it's safe, come on. Now we do it. But it is when you're in formation, it is everybody lined up side by side. The greatest thing, the greatest thing wives that you could do for your husbands is you decide today that you're gonna lead out to. If, if something spiritual is not happening in your family that you wish it would, it's your responsibility to do it just as much as it is his. Don't go to heaven and say, ah, oh, our family would have really followed God, but my husband was lousy. You can't do that. The spiritual well-being is equally upon you and you can carry the burden with your husband and husbands, you can share it. This is the way forward. And if you ever wonder, well, does this work? Every couple who's putting this into practice that I know are not coming to some kind of impasse and struggling over who gets their way, who, who has the final say. And all of the hard decisions that they're making, they make these decisions together because God's design really does work. The pushback against this that somebody might say was, well, someone, somebody has to have the final say. But whenever someone says to me, well, who's gonna have the final say in big decisions? That continues to work out of a Genesis 3 mindset and not a Genesis 1 and 2 or a heaven mindset. And y'all, what is the reward for this? On top of all these solutions that I've mentioned, here's the reward. Adam looks at this woman and he says, she is now bone of my bone and she's flesh of my flesh. She's here with me. I, I got somebody, God. And they were naked and, and, and loved each other in it all. It, what you get is that kind of intimacy and synergy and unconditional love for somebody who puts you first. And, and it's not just about clothes. It's about an intimacy that you're willing to open up and to be real with somebody and take daring risks in the bedroom and outside of it because you have this intimacy of somebody who knows you and loves you. They love you for you. They love you for you. And that is something that the whole world will never give to you. I promise you're not gonna find it. No one else has made that kind of commitment to you. Only God's design of one flesh does it. And so in the end, it's like two beautiful but dissonant pianos. When those pianos are tuned with the same tuning fork, they will always be perfectly in tune with one another. A marriage that's doing this the way I describe in God's design will have Jesus Christ as the tuning fork of their marriage and through him, you will always be perfectly in tune with one another. Will you bow your heads with me?